morning, everyone. Welcome to day two um, of our workshop on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the chemistry and chemical engineering fields. And I'm so excited to have you all back. Uh, for those who did not attend yesterday, uh, my name is Jeremy Mathis, and I am the director of the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology here at the, at the academies. And yesterday, we heard from a fantastic group of speakers who shared their ideas and their progress that they've made about established programs that focus on building DEI in the chemical sciences. And today we're going to hear now about emerging programs and also dedicate time for productive conversations about DEI in chemistry and chemical engineering with this community uh, over Slack. And as a reminder, there is an extensive Slack guidance document on our website for you to reference as you join the Slack workspace and participate in the conversation. And if you're a Slack novice like me, certainly use that document uh, for your guidance and also ask any of our staff that we have uh, on the Zoom for help if you need it. And please note, as we go through all of this, the event is being both broadcast and recorded and that by participating, you agree to have your questions and your thoughts relayed in, into perpetuity. And additionally, there will be a proceedings in brief published later this year that summarizes the conversations and the things that we've talked about at the workshop. So therefore, by submitting any questions or engaging in the conversations on Zoom and Slack, you are agreeing to have those comments published. And so we're now gonna to move to our first talk of the day. Our second keynote speaker is Dr. Geraldine Richmond. Dr. Richmond is the presidential chair in science and a professor of chemistry at the University of Oregon. Her teaching and extensive research efforts have focused on science communication and building a strong and inclusive workforce. She is the founding director of COACH, uh, a grassroots organization that has helped over 25,000 women scientists and engineers in career advancement in the United States and over two dozen developing countries. Unfortunately, Dr. Richmond wasn't able to join us live today. However, she was able to pre-record her talk for us earlier this week. So although she won't be able to take questions afterwards, we encourage all of you to share your thoughts and engage with one another on the Slack platform using hashtag Keynote2 for the discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to our video. I wanna thank you all again for participating. We had a great event yesterday and we're hoping to continue to build on that today. So thank you all uh, and uh, enjoy the keynote. Well, hello to everyone. I'm Jerry Richmond from the University of Oregon and I'm so delighted to be part of this really important uh, symposium having to do with diversity, equity and inclusion in the chemical sciences. Today, what I'm going to do is tell you about uh, some recent research that we've done funded by the Department of Energy, which does look at the views and career plans of uh, all graduate students uh, in chemistry, and but particular emphasis on women and underrepresented minorities. This project is in collaboration with uh, Jean Stockard, an, an amazing social scientist who's worked with us for many years who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Oregon, and also my dear friend, Celeste Rolfing, uh, who was at NSF and then AAAS and is now retired, but working very closely with COACH. So I want, to, um, I want to give a shout out though, to one of the most important women in my life, and that would be Marianne Fox and uh, who we have just lost uh, recently, in the last week, but she was an incredibly powerful and special woman in the chemical sciences. But in particular, I want to go back to 1996, where she had an incredible influence on me as well as the development of COACH. So she and I uh, were on the board of uh, the Basic Energy Sciences, uh, the advisory board of the Department of Energy. And in that particular meeting, uh, one of the speakers, had, um, had uh, that was speaking uh, was not paying attention to a question that a woman on the board had asked, and that was me. And Marianne Fox, uh, with her strong voice, told him that he needed to answer my question and not ignore it. So it caused a little, caused a little bit of a fluff uh, in the meeting, but it was right on. So afterwards, we got together for lunch, the two of us, and because um, I wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about what she was thinking about at the time. 
uh, she was uh, in her career. And uh, as we were talking and she was telling me that, you know, she was very frustrated about the fact that, that she was uh, feeling that, that she was not, uh, she was being held back uh, in her career by strange sort of, I, I considered it what she from story was telling me, kind of jealousy issues uh, with regards to uh, her career. Uh, and um, said that, that she was thinking of making a move because it was very difficult for her under her current circumstance. And that really hit me hard because here is a woman who is a member of the National Science Board. She was in the National Academy of Sciences and weren't we beyond those gender issues at this point? But uh, obviously not. And so that conversation really struck me, uh, really struck me. But then I started to collect additional stories from other women that were sort of mid-career that I thought that were tenured that I thought would be beyond uh, this gender thing. And uh, we, I hear, started hearing stories such as these. Passed over, uh, accomplishments seemingly ignored, and also voices being ignored. And even more heartbreaking is uh, that our women of color, African-American, but few, women faculty we had at that time, uh, felt that they were being trotted out in the department to show the department's diversity, but otherwise were not paid much attention to. And women that were having children, um, but somehow it seemed like having that child changed people's views of them or their aspirations to be successful. All of those then led to the initiation of COACH, the Committee on the Advancement of Women Chemists, uh, which we were initially renamed. And so I brought together, Jean Pemberton and I brought together a group of women scientists um, and our chemists. Uh, and you'll recognize many of these names here that in their original institutions, um, uh, some have gone on to others, but they were really formative in having a discussion about what is going on that's really uh, slowing down the leadership uh, of those women that aspire to uh, be the best in their fields. Uh, and so we had a discussion about this and found that we needed to do something. We needed to do something. And that's where it was actually Janet Osterjung who suggested the acronym COACH for the Committee on the Advancement of Women Chemists. So from that, then we created a series of workshops to help women um, be, uh, have the kind of skills to advance in their careers in leadership, in negotiation and communication and uh, started offering those to the community with the funding of NSF. First, the Dreyfus Foundation, Bob Lichter, uh, NSF, and then uh, NIH and also DOE. And so with those workshops uh, we, that we start giving to the community at ACS meetings, um, we, uh, they, the popularity of them has now spread beyond chemistry to a lot of different fields, and that's why we mostly just go by coach. Uh, but up to this point, over 25,000 women uh, have uh, attended these workshops and we have research that shows what the impact it's had on their lives. Now beyond that then, uh, about 2012, we started adding to that, uh, working with women scientists in developing countries, not only with the workshops, but helping them network in their particular fields. And so that's been a wonderful experience also that still continues today, although many of our workshops are virtual. But please, if you're interested in, in what we do, please go to the COACH uh, website. So the th kinds of things that major projects that we have going on is certainly the coach career building workshop such I, I have here. But we also then have our research on STEM workforce issues that uh, Jean has been leading all these years and that's what this uh, talk is about. And then also uh, working with organizations. We've just had a big project with NIST to help them on issues of diversity and inclusion. And we've also been working with the DOE National Laboratories uh, to do survey research to help them understand what issues are at their laboratories, especially for women getting into uh, leadership positions, but actually uh, men too, and also underrepresented groups. And then uh, also, as I mentioned, working with uh, women in developing countries. At this point now, I've worked with a couple of dozen uh, different countries, a lot of them in Africa and Asia, Central Asia, and also in Latin America. And, uh, and, but that's a whole talk in itself, but one that's been extraordinarily gratifying as we've taken coach to those women and those countries. So let me now focus on uh, this talk and particularly our coach research team in which we conduct climate studies on climate issues, 
but also challenges for underrepresented groups. Um, and the kind of need to understand what kind of additional programs we can put together for the new generation of, of uh, women coming up uh, to help them in professional development. And then we also do assessment of the impact of our programs, which we have done for 20 years now. And in fact, um, we are still surveying the cadre of women that took our coach workshops back in 2000 uh, to see how they have progressed in their career. And if they can even remember what is the workshops and what were in them. And it's amazing how much they uh, remembers, uh, you know, for someone that doesn't have much memory, it just is stunning how, how grateful they are for what they learned. And many of them now are in positions of power, whether it be presidents of universities or provosts, and they continue to say how valuable it was to have the kind of coach training that we gave then and would continue to give today. Okay, so what I want to talk about in particular is this, uh, the paper that we put out in PNAS uh, in January, and that has to do with the factors contributing to the low retention of women and URM students in uh, US chemistry departments. And again, based on uh, the ACS data. So this is really to try to understand through the survey data, the kind of experiences that they have in graduate school and how that might differ by gender or uh, their identification. Factors that might moderate or help explain these differences also. And again, uh, Mary Kirkhoff, uh, big, uh, my hats off to you and your colleagues for doing this incredible survey that's so rich uh, that allowed us to uh, go deeper into some of the issues that uh, followed their report. Designed to understand the student, graduate students' views and long-term goals of reducing more positive and perceptive graduate students. Okay, so our analysis is uh, a multi-regression used to examine the association and experiences of uh, these different graduate students, uh, whether it be gender, for, gender or identification of URM or their first generation status here in the program and actually also the status of their department. And so we took a deeper dive uh, using uh, Jean Stockard's skills to be able to unravel some of the uh, nuances in the data that gave us a lot of really valuable insight, which I will tell you about. So we had two studies. Uh, the first one is uh, really looking at the full cadre of PhD programs uh, across the country. Um, that would be, as you see, 2,500 chemistry graduate students, most of them in uh, PhD programs. And sample two is really restricting it to just the top 10 US chemistry, top 100 uh, US chemistry departments. And this is the focus of the PNAS paper. And the uh, sample one is the one that we've written up for a special issue of Journal of Chemical, Chemical Education uh, that's just being submitted now. Most of the talk that I will give will be on this uh, sample two, but I will come back and talk about uh, sample one as we go forward. Okay, so uh, we broke this up into four issues. Uh, one was to understand the relationships that the graduate students have with their advisor, including their involvement in uh, the research, their the availability to help them, their encouragement, and also their treatment. So it was really about their, their advisor. How did they feel about their advisor or their advisor's role in helping support them go through graduate school? And the second uh, was the degree of desired support that they receive from others in the group or others in their department. So this is more peer level. Did they, did they receive the kind of support that they wanted from, uh, from those that are in their group? And how did that break down with regards to their gender or uh, underrepresented minority status? And a third one, uh, which is equally, if not more important, and that is how did they feel about their financial support? Was it adequate to meet the cost of living where they lived? And finally, um, whether how the students, what their aspirations were, what they decided to do uh, in finishing their degree and future career plans. Now in the, uh, the this study that I'll talk about for the top 100 institutions, uh, the average, the, the, the uh, survey is really averaging out students that are in their uh, second to third year in uh, graduate school, whereas the uh, other is used that time frame. Whereas when I talk about the second survey, it will actually have some time dependence with it from you know what they felt like in their first year versus how they felt uh, things were going in their later years. 
but the the um, the one for the, the the survey, which is the top 100, will be uh, will be really focused on the second or third grade. All right, so let's get into the uh, results. So um, based on 22 questions, and again, a shout out to the uh, survey that was put together um, by the ACS. Um, uh, how did they how did they rate their uh, the advisor's involvement? As you see here in the search, their ability, their uh, availability and encouragement and so forth. So uh, on the average, uh, now you can think about what do you think that grade would be? Because <laughs> uh, I put it on a grading scale. As a good academic, I put it on a grading scale. This is the grade, um, the average grade that was given. Well, it's better than a C, right? <laughs> it's better than a D. Uh, kind of, it was a 3.6 on a five point scale. Um, but that means there's uh, improvement that need to be made. And quite, quite strikingly, uh, when you break down these institutions, these departments, uh, by the rankings, uh, by the amount of money that NSF uh, gives them, if that's uh, you know, as one way that the ranking uh, is done, um, then uh, and we divided those into quartiles. And it turned out that the top quartile institutions showed lower uh, advisor ratings uh, than those that went uh, uh, lower uh, quartiles. So that's really, uh, and there's, uh, one can think about what the explanation might be, uh, but we certainly don't have an answer for that. But one might imagine, for example, that at those top quartile, you have very, uh, some research groups are very large, and maybe that's a reflection uh, of that. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a wake-up call to our top institutions who have big graduate programs, um, large number of graduate students and, and also very good graduate students in terms of their treatment of their graduate students at, with regards to the advisors. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about now how that breaks down with regards to demographics. And so what I have here, this is the average Z scores and I've broken that down into, uh, now the plot is showing this, uh, URM women, URM men, non-URM women, and non-URM men, a majority uh, students. And so what's really striking, uh, well, first of all, it's great to see that our uh, URM men are, uh, feel that they're getting uh, good support and advice from their advisors. That's really great. But look at this. This is just appalling, quite frankly. This is actually an average, this line here I have here is an average. So, uh, so this advisor thing isn't working so well uh, for women, uh, certainly statistically significant for our uh, non-URM women, but especially for our women of color. And that comes out very strongly in the data. So let me explain that a little bit further. So you, in, in all these questions, URM women are less likely to report that their advisor, and I'm gonna go through these, but I think we need to think hard about this encourage them to take challenges to pursue, their, to pursue their aspiration, advocate for them, gain credit for their contributions, engage them in writing proposals and doing presentations, helping develop professional relationships, indicate they were satisfied with the student's work, created a fair environment, gave regular feedback. So, uh, but to uh, give you a little bit of background behind this uh, data analysis, using uh, gene using the multivariate statistical analysis indicate that these differences could not be explained by what year the students were in graduate program, educational level of their parents, whether they were married or not, the value attached to different aspects of their careers, including the size and prestige of the department, and also the diversity of their uh, university. So again, really striking, and I think a wake-up call to uh, to advisors at our uh, chemist in our chemistry departments. But uh, 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 the smart also uh, needs to come from for their research groups. So let's look at the data from how they feel they're getting support from their research groups. And so uh, now you see uh, again a really striking result. And so for the URM men, uh, for the URM women, um, you see uh, 
well, first of all, we'll start with the non-URM women. Certainly they don't feel they're getting quite as much support as the men, but it's, and it's uh, statistically significant, but it's still not that much different as you see for the uh, URM women and the URM men. So you see that uh, in particular, and so they don't, uh, our underrepresented minority students in the, the group don't feel that they're getting the kind of support from their peers and colleagues in the, their laboratory as well as department. But in particular, what's really striking uh, is really the, the, the URM men and how they just don't feel that they're integrating into the group and getting the kind of support that they, that they really need in order to be successful. Now, why that's so different, um, we don't have any information on that, but it is food for thought. But again, um, you know, oftentimes we put the blame uh, of graduate students not completing their degrees on the advisor and maybe seeing the data that that's warranted or the institution. But boy, graduate students in your own group, your own peer group, you can merely make a difference to reach out to someone that maybe you're uncomfortable with because they're a different color than you uh, or a different race, but this is really, really important uh, to make it more of a family environment, a supportive environment, an inclusive environment in all aspects of how you operate in the laboratory and in our research groups. This is really, really important. So a little bit more uh, down that line, those that perceived they did not receive, putting it in different numbers other than the disease scores, 24% of the men said they did not receive uh, the kind of support that they would hope they would get. And URM women, 16%. But then also, it's not everyone. And it's not they alone. Uh, at least one in 10 uh, feel that they, they feel kind of an outsider to the group for not getting the support. Those that, did, but they, they're a significant number that do believe that they receive desired support. And so that's kudos to those groups that these numbers represent. And that would be 50% of the URM uh, men, because I'm focusing now on the difference between the men, and, and, and two thirds uh, from the non-URM men. But there's still a lot uh, more to go for all of us to create more inclusive uh, graduate environments. And I think, you know, I do think an advisor plays a role in setting the culture for the group and making it clear uh, that their expectations are that everyone in the group uh, operates in a collaborative manner, supporting each other in a way that can move forward. So that's also a role of the advisor to set the culture of the group. Okay, now another big one, adequacy of financial support. Uh, and the question to this was, uh, the funding for my graduate studies is adequate to meet the cost of living where I live. So. Uh, again, we go back and we look here at our data and we have uh, URM women, URM men, and our uh, majority students. Again, really striking difference, really striking difference. Just, to sh just shows how uh, different uh, financial situation can be. For those, as we know, many underrepresented minority students come with less family uh, resources uh, to be able to backstop uh, any kind of expenses, um, but, and also a higher li likelihood that they have loans. So you see there's a large difference in URM students indicating insu ins insufficient fund financial support in this, uh, these uh, years, and also the sort of two to three years are averaged over uh, graduate program. And also the data shows that the percentage of support of the resources uh, getting your own, having your own, needing your own personal resources, whether that be family or, or other, uh, even uh, other pickup jobs, uh, was twice as large for uh, URM students as for other students. So that they, needed, uh, they needed to be able to, what, to be able to survive, to live, um, they needed to have, uh, it was very difficult. They had to rely on other personal support more than, uh, 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 than their majority students. So, uh, and going to these, again, looking at these top 100 schools, uh, this difference between URM and majority students uh, perceived adequacies of financial support was by, was really not moderated by uh, marital status or having dependents, the extent to which they received TA, RA, or fellowships, 
or the composition of the department faculty or diversity of their institutions. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of data, uh, there is a lot of data out this about student debt um, and how it hurts. It, it hits uh, many of our underrepresented minority students. And this is really a very serious issue. And I think this is a serious issue, not just for our top 100 schools, but I think for our, all of our schools. And I'll come back to this a little bit later uh, as I talk about um, uh, some other issues we found with regards to all of the, all of the schools. But this is an issue that I've been pushing really hard on uh, as a member of the National Science Board, because I think it's so critically important it's so critically important that we get these uh, stipends up. So now looking at all schools, 67% um, uh, of all students felt that's adequate, but only 30%, but again, uh, there's still a third that didn't feel it was adequate. In this case, 37% uh, of the master's students felt they had adequate funding, which is not very many. And at the MSIs, which, uh, the MSIs, the minority serving institutions, uh, the number was even lower. Interestingly, for the first year uh, for all these schools, the URM students were more likely to say that they got adequate funding with a larger portion from official sources such as RAs, TAs, or fellowships. However, after the first year, uh, they were many more reported inadequate funding, uh, more coming from their personal resources, loans, and family. So it may be that the TA ships pay more or there might be special funds to bring the students in, uh, but that falls by the wayside or loans that become due, that falls by the wayside uh, very quickly as they enter into their second and third year. But again, uh, the results reflect the inadequacy of graduate student stipends. Now, if you do just a simple calculation, um, if your graduate students are working, if the expectation is that your graduate students are working really hard, and they're working 50, maybe 60 hours a week, they're certainly making less than minimum wage. They're certainly making less, less than minimum wage. And if you have a family to support, you can imagine how difficult that would be, let alone taking care of your own uh, situation. And keep in mind that, you know, I don't think I need to remind you that these are in the, uh, in, students are in their 20s, uh, maybe early 30s. And in those years then, we're asking them for, uh, five, six, seven years to make uh, 10, 12, maybe $14 an hour and work really, really hard um, at a time where if they were go out and work at a company or get another job, they might make enough money to even save some uh, so they can buy a house by the time they're 30 or, or, uh, or have children. So I think we have to take really seriously this issue of uh, of low financial support. And I'll, I'll bring this back again, but certainly Artie Bienenstock, uh, Professor Emeritus at Stanford and myself have been working really hard. And I think the National Science Board is taking this up uh, seriously too, but there's gotta be some levels, levers higher that are really, um, that are concerned about, um, about having the talent that we need in order to solve the issues that we have ahead of us, whether it be in climate or health or overpopulation, we need the best talent possible. And if we're losing a lot of students because they don't feel that it's financially viable for them to do it, then that's a uh, talent we can't afford to waste. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about commitment to finishing the PhD and remaining in the chemical sciences. So this again, this data is now for the top 100. And so uh, looking at this data, and this is for women are in blue, orange men, and I'm gonna look at the highest quartile. So the women are significantly uh, less likely to finish and uh, to believe that they will finish their PhD and remain in the chemical sciences. As you go in this highest quartile, as you go to the second quartile, you see that becomes more equal as you go to the uh, 50 to 100 uh, ranked uh, schools. So again, uh, a serious issue, because uh, this is statistically significant on the scale of uh, three, uh, three being strongly agree versus uh, disagree. They're significantly less likely to be committed to completing their PhD and remaining in chemistry and particularly in our most prestigious institutions. What about uh, commitment to a tenure track professorship? Now this is an academic salary. So those of you in, 
an industry or government laboratory, don't, I don't want you to think that I think that's, that the professorship is the only career path by any means, but this is what the survey was designed to do. And that was to interest in completing a postdoc and becoming a professor with research emphasis. And they were, uh, and interestingly, those that were most likely to aspire to do this uh, were really our first generation students, uh, college students, that's great. Uh, those who attached, uh, but I don't think this is so great, but uh, those that attach less importance to a job that allowed them to have family time and have other interests. Um, but also to the other side of that is the students that had more supportive uh, advisors then also were more likely to say that they would go on to, to complete and go to a postdoc and take on a professorship in, at, with a research emphasis. But I think this, this one in particular is interesting because I don't think that we really want to have a population of professors, a celibate professors, uh, uh, male or female, having a wide variety of, of interests beyond the science as well as families is really important. So uh, I think it's important for us to to uh, make sure that it looks normal uh, to uh, have outside interests and also a family and not just wait till you're tenured and, and a later stage of your career in order to, uh, to be able to, to do that. Okay, now this is also an uh, important uh, result. So what's the effect of at least one URM uh, faculty in the department on your career plans? interest in completing a postdoc and becoming a professor. Okay, so URM uh, students were more likely than others to express aspirations to a postdoc and a professor if there was at least, if there was at least one URM faculty member in the department, just one, just one. So if you look, for example, this is for the non-URM students, and this is the case where uh, for the non-URM students where you have no URM faculty uh, versus at least one. Oh, it's a, a little bit of a difference, uh, but not, not all that much. However, look at this. Um, for uh, URM students, having one faculty member in the department, um, uh, at least one in the department, look at how that shot up. So this just emphasizes the importance of the diverse, need for diversity in our departments. You know, I think we've seen this uh, for, uh, in general, for women, as the number of women in chemistry departments have gone up, uh, that we, I think it encourages more women to go in, while the same thing can be said for underrepresented minority students. And a shout out to ACS and also to Oxide for working this, uh, putting this data uh, out there so the departments can see how they're doing over time with regards to uh, women and underrepresented minority faculty. But this, you know, it, it's going to happen. We're going to get more diverse departments, but not as not if we uh, continue to have largely uh, minor, majority uh, faculty members in, in the department. Now, uh, just a, a little bit uh, about levels of support from advisors and peers uh, in minority serving uh, departments. In this case, uh, uh, that there's that was very similar. There wasn't that much difference between uh, support from advisors. It's very similar, as I just said, to in uh, minority departments versus majority departments. But also, uh, the students reported less likely to report adequate funding as opposed to um, the majority institutions. Now, these minority serving institutions, there are only one or two that are in the top 100. So now we're into the other ranked uh, institutions. But, and as I mentioned before, they do show a lower uh, level of adequate funding. Um, the students report a lower level of adequate funding. Um, and, uh, but the, the amazing thing is, and this is why our MSI institutions are so important to the system and to our students, our communities, and that is they're more likely to complete a degree. That's an undergraduate degree in STEM as well as produce uh, a PhD and pursue postdoctoral studies if they come are working in a minority serving institution. And uh, just uh, uh, this uh, few days ago, uh, the National Science Board, we organized a session that highlighted the importance of minority serving institutions and the kind of unique support system and environment that they uh, provide for students. Um, so that's online. I encourage all of you to see that. Um, because it really points out 
just the unique environment that, our environment that many of our minority serving institutions give to their, uh, give to their students, but they do it um, with a penny and a song. Many of them are under-resourced and the hope is with, the, uh, with this administration, we'll see more attention to support of minority serving institutions because they are so important. And that includes, uh, let's not forget about our, our tribal colleges because they, uh, in particular, uh, where students want to be able to continue to practice their culture, to be in their culture, and the tribal colleges provide a, a, the ability to do that while they're also um, uh, getting their experience. So shout out to our tribal colleges, both for undergraduate as well as uh, graduate school. Okay, comments, student views of how to better support them. Well, better health insurance, <laughs> oh, big surprise. So this is a whole series of comments that they put out, more affordable housing, uh, as you can see here, better maternity and paternity leave, increased access to childcare, and boy, has COVID made a difference here, right? I mean, these things are just glaring now. Um, uh, we see story, we hear stories of uh, a woman uh, uh, teaching her class out of a closet with her three-year-old outside. She locked the door so she could teach her course, but the kid figured out how to unlock the door and, and came into her, uh, to, uh, her classroom, so in, in the closet. But uh, I think it's really important that we take this more seriously, but also financial help, they, they say that they certainly need the higher salaries, lower tuition costs, and student fees need to be reduced and also help with uh, career development. Okay, so recommendations going forward. Let me just wrap this up with a few recommendations. So, so official policy should make it clear. Success of graduate students is the key to success of faculty, their research, the department and institution. Policy need to make that very clear because our graduate students are the lifeblood of our uh, research institutions. And I believe, and I'm pounding the table on this one, that graduate programs that receive federal funding should be required to make public the retention and success rates, including demographics of PhD and master's students in their STEM departments. I believe that that's, we need to be assessing this, we need to be monitoring this so students can have a choice as to whether uh, they should go to one graduate program or another based on whether they, uh, they think they will succeed and complete the PhD program. And let me give a shout out to the NGLS uh, coalition. Uh, this is a group that has, uh, that UCSF and also Johns Hopkins that has put together, this is ne uh, Next Generation Life Sciences Coalition. And what they are doing is they are having institutions, graduate programs report the data and then they put it on the website. And I think there are uh, maybe a couple of dozen institutions that have done that anywhere from Michigan Tech to MIT. And that's what we need to have. We need to have this be nationwide uh, because they've worked out a lot of the bugs, but we need to have a reporting mechanism for departments to show who's doing a good job and maybe who needs to improve. Uh, departments, uh, leaderships must take every opportunity to develop their commitment to equity and inclusivity. And that means not just one meeting a year, but that means messaging needs to be interwoven uh, throughout all the messaging that diversity and inclusion and a supportive environment is important and reward excellence in faculty mentoring and advising. Use surveys to monitor student experience and need and review and address financial support of students. And make aggressive efforts to increase faculty diversity. So graduate students, other last couple of ones, graduate students and postdocs have a really important role to play in creating a supportive and inclusive environment. So let's step up and uh, take ownership, graduate students and postdocs, of welcoming everyone that works in your laboratory. And I think policymakers and funding agencies must work together to address inadequate graduate stipends. The funding levels for uh, grant proposals that we operate on at our universities, merely asking our, our institutions or particularly our research grants to be able to uh, go up to uh, something like $40,000 a year um, would mean that you have less graduate students than you can support. And so what this means is that we actually have to increase uh, the amount of money that's out there for, uh, for research 
uh, that are done by our graduate students at our academic institutions and also our postdocs. But that means that there must be a serious recognition for the fact that we could, are losing talent because they financially cannot afford to go to graduate school. We need to take this seriously because it is our future. And with the myriad of problems that we face today, now with COVID, infectious diseases, climate change, and having clean water, we could go on. We need all the talent we can get and from all segments of our society. So with that, I thank you very much uh, for um, watching uh, this video. I apologize for not being able to be with you today. Life's gotten a little crazy these days. Um, but I'd also like to point you to look at the COACH website um, uh, to get more information about the programs which are continuing. Um, thanks to ACS for sharing the data and also the US Department of Energy uh, for funding us for all of these years to do our research. And then I've also shown here the uh, PNAS uh, article uh, if you want more information. And uh, again, uh, thank you very much. And I wish you the best as we all go forward on this mission to make everything I would like to thank Dr. Jerry Richmond again uh, wholeheartedly for pre-recording that talk for us and sharing um, this morning that keynote talk. Uh, we wish we could have had her in person, but we feel uh, fortunate that we were able to hear her remarks um, in any case. I would like to encourage all of the participants who are watching to continue to engage in conversation via the Slack workspace, um, especially throughout the upcoming break, specifically focusing your conversation in the channel named hashtag Keynote2. We will now take a 30 minute break. We ask that you come back to the Zoom by 1220 PM Eastern time so that we can begin session two. Thank you.